publication of the book with his friends Dave Smalley and Laura Albert. According to the Los Angeles Times, American Hardcore is the definitive treatment of hardcore punk. And when it first appeared in 2001, it changed the way we look at punk rock. The book is now in five languages and led the way to the creation of the acclaimed documentary American Hardcore, the History of American Punk Rock, 1980-1986, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2006. With the resurgence of punk rock and continued interest in the significant American DIY movement, Blush has expanded the book and tonight he will share some of the images, interviews, and stories that he included in his new edition. American Hardcore of Childhood History is the ultimate punk rock Christmas present. <laughs> Joining the student tonight are hardcore punk rock singer Dave Smalley and author Laura Albert. I'll let Stephen introduce them more formally in a moment. Following tonight's presentation, Stephen, Dave, and Laura would be happy to take your questions. I'll be walking around with this microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. They'll then stick around and chat and sign books, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming Laura Albert, Dave Small, and Stephen Rush to the stage. How you doing? I'm going to bring these guys out for a little while. Thank you so much for coming. I don't take this lightly. Um, this is, since this is kind of more of a general audience, I'm just going to kind of take you through a slideshow. Um, I think the, story, the pictures tell the stories better than I can grab on. Um, here's the cover of the uh, new version of American Hardcore. Um, I had so much more to say. There's so much more I learned. I've been through the film. I've been through the new technologies. You know, it's a very different time from when I started the book 15 years ago. It originally started out uh, 2001, original edition. Um, it took me six years, three rewrites. Started in 1995, first interview with the Necros, you know, and, and just kind of took it from there. Um, came out in five languages, including Japanese, French, Italian, a few other ones. Um, in 2001, I hooked up with my friend Paul Rackman, who I knew from the Boston Hardcore days. He had made the Bad Braids Eye Against Eye video. He had made the uh, Gangrene Alcohol video. He also made a lot of stuff you would know from TV, like Alice in Chains, Man in the Box, Temple of the Dog, Hunger Strike, uh, Pantera, Cemetery Gates. You know, so it's like a real obvious um, person to work with on this. We worked it on a DIY manner. No one gave us a penny. Uh, we edited on my couch for four years, and uh, we sent a rough trade. Uh, we sent a, a, a rough cut to uh, Sundance. And at the last day, they said, we love your film, come to Park City. So we went there and we killed. And we put out the film. We got signed to Sony Picture Classics. You know, I got to say, if somebody comes out this total DIY thing, it's kind of troubling and weird, but true that nobody treated me better in my business life. And, um, you know, they really put the thing on the map and got it out there for, for everybody to see. Um, we also worked with Vans, who helped promote it. I got to give it to Paul that when the film was coming out, uh, we needed some money for some parties and some events, and Paul kind of called up uh, called up bands and said, "Listen, motherfuckers, like you make millions of dollars off of punk rockers, it's time for you to pay back and pay the bands, and you know." And they they did it, so you know, props to that. We did it, we did it. And uh, then 2007 was the uh, DVD, so um, you know, just kind of uh, you know, just kind of. This is the story of what we went through. And here's the key art for the uh, soundtrack album. So again, you know, we, we were really able to get this out there. Okay. When I was uh, 18 years old, I was uh, going to college in uh, Washington, D.C. And I came up here to New York to see some shows. Uh, TSOL was playing around the area. And when I flipped in New Jersey and I met Mike Graney, who was the manager of the Dead Kennedys, and he's telling me, like, we can't get a gig in D.C., you're the music director of your radio station, I'll show you how to do it, why don't you uh, book the show? So, a couple months later, there was the Dead Kennedys in my school cafeteria, two blocks from the White House. The phone ringing off the hook at the school about the Dead Kennedys and Joel Opera, and almost getting thrown out of school. But um, it kind of put me on this path. And, you know, here's a show that we did, um, Trouble Funk Minor Threat. This is a show they still talk about a lot down in Washington. This is really where this whole thing got started. 
Here's another Dead Kennedy show I did. You can tell my graphic skills over there. Uh, this show, uh, Dead Kennedys played half the show and then it got shut down by the cops. Here's I did a lot of shows at this place called Space 2 Arcade. Yeah, so here's uh, Circle Jerks, a government issue. Here's uh, Back to School Thrash, right? Pretty self-explanatory. GBH's first American show. Suicidal Tendencies' first tour. The Fate's last show. You know, here's, you know, here's tickets. You know, Black Flag and Pierce Hall. This is Black Flag meet puppets in the Nick Heights. You try booking Nick Heist in a church and then talk to the rector the next day. <laughs> that was the one and only show ever at Pierce Hall. And here I am uh, putting up posters for the PIL Minor Threat Show. So, um, you know, when someone asked me, like, you know, who the fuck are you to write this book about hardcore? I'm telling you, half these motherfuckers crashed on my couch. Rock and Roll History 101. <laughs> Rock music is a series of actions and reactions. There's something really awesome, and then things get lame, and then there's like a new thing that happens. That, and there's just this constant cycle that happens every five, ten years. So you had Elvis Presley, it got you Pat Boone. The Revolution brought you the Beatles. Here's Woodstock, you know, the lexicon that the Beatles had set up just went to this incredible level. You know, and people are feeling great about what was going on, but eventually you get to the mid '70s. You know, and you know it's time for a new revolution, so you get punk rock. You know, and that's punk rock's awesome. You know, we all come out of punk rock. Hardcore was called hardcore punk because we all come out of it, but it was very fashion based. You know, it was, a, it was about a fashion. You know, hardcore is not about fashion, as, as I'll kind of show you. So you had punk, and you had his ugly kid brother, New Wave. <laughs> you know, and so this is kind of what's like, this is what, the, this is what music was like when hardcore is coming around. So, there's people like looking for a reaffirmation of punk, like you had with the Ramones. You know, stripped down, it's about the energy, it's about the speed, it's not about the fashion. That's what hardcore was. So, it's coming out of bands like the Ramones and Sham 69. You know, <laughs> Sham 69, Angelic Upstarts, Cockney Rejects, like super important bands. They set the look, the standard, you know, that blue collar kind of rock that became hardcore. The Kids Are United by Sham 69, you know. Every band did that song. <laughs> and here's what all the hardcore bands, they look like that. You know, that's what they're coming out of. Here's your young Henry Rollins. <laughs> here's Wasted Youth, right? All fitting in line with the, the vibe that we're talking about. Circle Jerks. This is a minor threat concert. This is a negative, uh, a naked ray gun show. This was so radical from what was happening in the days of rock music. Here's an early black flag either, I can't remember if this is the Pep Lounge or Mud Club from uh, 1981. Mud Club, thank you. And uh, Henry with uh, a few tattoos. So, you know, again, really early in this whole game. You know, the Bad Rings, right? Super important band. Teach to the youth, teaching the kids. You know, and also the thing about the Bad Rings is like, unlike half these motherfucking bands, these guys can actually play. You know, and they just kind of set the standard for what hardcore became. You know, I'm talking about the look, the fashion. This is about as fashionable as you got. This is um, kids from Southern California. All came from the beach towns. Kind of created their new kind of punk energy. And, um... This is a photo by Edward Culver, and uh, Jack Grisham from TSOL told me that he stopped wearing the chains on his belt because when he was committing crimes and jumping over fences, they would get caught. So, but that's what we were dealing with. And here's, we're coming to New York City, you see the difference, you know, this is, you know, we're talking about what was going on in LA, and here's what's going on in New York. This is a, this is a photo from Jimmy Gestapo, um, you know, this is them representing back in the day, 1981. A lot of what we're doing here today, too, is <coughs> giving props to New York hardcore, because what we see as hardcore today really comes out of New York hardcore. You know, it's not really like the D.C. band. It really is like Pro Mag, Murphy's Law, Agnostic Front, Warzone, you know, things like that. So this is a great photo. And, uh, and here's a photo from outside of uh, CBGB's Rest in Peace. Um, a young Todd Youth. And Joe Bruno, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
kind. This, this is the this is the foundation, right? This is where it kind of starts. Oh, we right there. And here, you know, there's three main guys, you know, in the very early pictures of them. And this is the guys who start the whole fucking thing. It's Harley Flanagan of the cro Jimmy Gestapo of Murphy's Law, and on the right, Vinny Stigma of Agnostic Front. Now, I know there was something on the internet that said that I said that I, Vinny Stigma doesn't play guitar on the Agnostic Front records. What I said was there was this weird period in the late eight, mid-late 80s when... They did an album called Cause for Alarm that was written by Pete Steele of Typo Negative, and Roger wasn't writing lyrics, and, and sometimes Vinny would get up there, you know, and just jump around, and they wouldn't actually turn him up all the time, but he absolutely is the guitarist of Agnostic Front, he's the guitarist on United Blood, you know, and all that stuff on, you know, so I just wanted to clear that up, you know. Okay, I'm talking about how is punk rock different than... Uh, Punk rock is different from back in the day, right? It's like, you know, you wouldn't have... This is the reaction to a Black Flag show in uh, Los Angeles. Like, you wouldn't get this for, like, Avenged Sevenfold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Warner Brothers was not going to put out this record. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody wanted this. Every fucking policeman in America had it out for this damn millions of dead times. <laughs> If Tipper Gore had only started like a year or two before or earlier, she would have gone after the big high <coughs> And I don't know any Live Nation concerts like this. Um, you know, this was the most radical thing I think I've still ever seen was the Dead Kennedys playing at the Washington Memorial, you know, as an anti-Reagan show as helicopters are circling above them. You know, like, the police ready to start a riot, any sort. And here's, you know, the subhumans was the member of the band actually got involved in some terrorism and blowing up some multinational corporation. Uh, you know, so it really went that far. So this is, what I'm talking about with hardcore is like I'm talking about a movement. I'm not talking about a music. I'm not talking about who's got the best tats and who rules the pit. I'm talking about like, like bigger ideas that really all came from this movement. DIY, you know, doing things for non-economic non terms. It was a very powerful, powerful time. And I talk about this 80 to 86 thing because, not because, oh, my salad days ended in 87, but because on and on you see, you know, Black Flag's first big record is 1980, they break up in 86. Dead Kennedy's first record is 1980, they break up in 86. Minor Threat started in 1980, and by 1986 they're Fugazi. You know, Whisker Du signed to Warner Brothers. It's the start of speed metal. It's like a, it's like a whole other era that's going on. So, um... You know, we, we looked at the pictures of Black Flag before. This is Black Flag in 1986. You know, it's, it's about time for them to stop. <laughs> and, you know, TSOL, one of the most intense bands ever. It's really hard to listen to their records and understand it sometimes. But, you know, just in terms of scary-ass motherfuckers, it really was TSOL. This is TSOL in 1980. This is them and their friends digging up graves. And this is TSOL in 87. <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, they had friends, they had friends like Guns N' Roses, they thought it could work, you know, they wanted to make it, so I'm talking about like the idea thing had changed, you know, so, and here's, you know, gangrene with cocaine, you know, so, you don't want to know the time was uh, over for that, um, there you go, so, um, that's my introduction, and uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists, uh, uh, first off, uh, one of my favorite singers, uh, D.Y.S., Dag Nasty, Descendants, all down by the side. I say down by the wall, wherever you get it. Come on, everybody, let's hear for Dave Smalley. <laughs> 